the realm of the dead. <clears throat> By his resurrection, he gave joy to his disciples and he gave light to the nations with the light of his salvation. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday our lives and forever. Amen. O Word of God, who can adequately praise you for the depth of your compassion, and what voice can bless you, for you are above all praise. Neither mind nor tongue can describe the wonders you accomplished on Sunday, the day of your resurrection from the dead. And so with the psalmist David we cry out, This is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice in it and be glad. Now, O Christ our God, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense which we offer you to forgive our sins. Give peace of mind to those in distress and comfort to those who are anxious. Bring back those who are far, and watch over those who are near. Guide the shepherd, sanctify the priest, and purify the deacons. Pardon all sinners, and guard the righteous. Protect orphans, and help widows. Drive away all conflicts, and put an end to all dissension. Remember the faithful departed and grant them rest in your heavenly kingdom, that with them we may celebrate that eternal feast. And we raise glory to you, to your blessed Father, and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. the sweet fragrance of our incense and make us worthy to announce your resurrection with the angels and to proclaim it with your women disciples and to rejoice in its victory with your pure apostles and we raise glory to you to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat>
Joy from the mountain, Sunday is a feast so great. Offer praise to the Lord God and with angels celebrate. <laughs> from the first letter of St. Paul, the Corinthian. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, as a body is one, though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. Now you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. Some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, then gifts of healing, assistance, administration, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work mighty deeds? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Strive eagerly for the greatest spiritual gifts. Praise be to God always. Amen. of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaim life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. 
the Lord Jesus says, Behold, I send you like sheep in the midst of wolves. So be prudent as serpents and simple as doves. But beware of men, for they shall hand you over to courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you shall be led before governors and kings for my sake as a witness before them and before the pagans. And when they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. You shall be given at that moment what you are to say, for it shall not be you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother shall hand over brother to death, and the father his child. Children shall rise up against parents and have them put to death. And you shall be hated by all because of my name. But whosoever perseveres to the end shall be saved. And when they persecute you in one town, flee to another. Amen, I say to you, you shall not finish the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. No disciple is above his teacher, and no slave is above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher, and for the slave to become like his master. So if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, then how much more those of his household. This is the truth, peace be with you. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, of the Holy Spirit, Amen. This is one of those profoundly shocking Gospels. Really bad PR. Join the Gospel, follow me, and I guarantee they'll hunt you down, beat you, and kill you. But go ahead, sign on the bottom line. Like in other places where our Lord says, he who loves father, mother, brother, sister more than me is unworthy of me. So that's it, check off your family, sign the bottom line. And if you don't sign the bottom line, this is the path to salvation. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. We look at these texts and we're thinking, how in heaven's name have there ever been people to follow our Lord? It stands out from all the other propositions of religion, right? All you do, pray five times a day and you get paradise in Islam. Do these things, just do that, do these observances. Here our Lord says, do this, I'm guaranteeing your life is going to become painful. You must carry your cross daily. So there must be something in it that we don't get when we first see these texts or hear these words. And that's obviously the case. When we speak about death, death has three different meanings, really. The obvious ones in the gospel here, you die, you stop breathing, that's it, you're done. They cut off your head, they beat you to death, right? Like St. Jude, we commemorated on Wednesday. You'd be beaten to death in the streets of Beirut. But death also has two other meanings to it, which is in the proximity to God. Sin in itself, is an enemy of grace. It forms an obstacle. But for the same reason that sin is the enemy of grace, grace is the enemy of sin. 
And when grace enters in, there is always a turmoil within the individual soul in the beginning. Later on, when we are conformed to grace on a regular habitual basis, we become free. And our lives are liberated as we are elevated into the light. But when grace first enters our life, the same way that when someone lives choosing sin, they're erecting obstacles to the voice of God, to the grace of God. They're erecting by choosing death. That's a meaning behind sin. It is the death which is the obstacle and the distance from the divine light. And that obstacle is really what leads to eternal death. If we stay in that state, when we stop breathing, that physical death, that one of those three meanings, we continue in that same state of separation, which is hell. There's nothing dramatic that happens, we just die. And so therefore, the state that we have created our lives to be in, as an enemy of grace, continues that way in that state of separation. So that's clearly another sense of death, sin. But there is a third sense that St. Paul talks about when he says that if you have been baptized with Christ into his death, you have died to sin. Now we have a different question of a death to sin, not sin causing the death of eternal life, but now eternal life being the source of the death of sin. And that is when that life comes to us and again, as we mentioned, in the beginning of our spiritual life, it's always awkward, it's always clumsy, it's always painful. Because our disposition and our lives, our way of thinking, our habits, and sometimes habits for years, are confronted by grace, and there's always going to be a shock. But as grace begins to permeate and enter into a person's life, it kills those obstacles. It kills those things that stand in opposition to God and to God's voice. And so there is a death to sin, which is a very real and true reality. It's not a penitential question. It's not a juridical question. I sin, therefore I'm going to hell. Well, yes, if you stay in this sin. How many times I've heard over the decades, someone says, well, I'm already in this state of mortal sin, so why bother? It's like, that's a horrible thing to say. That's like saying, I have lung cancer, so I'm going to smoke two cartons instead of one. That's insane to keep introducing the toxicity into the system because it's not a juridical question. Oh, well, I've murdered once, so I might as well become a serial killer. That's insane. But that's the same kind of reasoning that someone will say to themselves. And so when we talk about the third form of death, of a death to sin, this is a reality that St. Paul talks about that is initiated by your baptism. So what's going on here? When we speak about God, this reality that underlies everything that exists, it is a transcendent and an infinite reality, having no resemblance to us whatsoever. This is a big thing to keep in mind. We reflect God. God does not reflect us. We have an image of God in us. God is not like us. We are like God, and God is infinitely transcendent beyond us. That's the first thing to always, and that's already an excellent prayer in the beginning, to be able to just stand in awe before the divine reality. It's why in the Eastern traditions of the Jesus prayer, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Prostration, stand up again. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Prostration, down metani, forehead to the ground, before the divine one. Just simply to come to the awareness of how transcendent God is. He is not a vending machine that we pump novenas into to get stuff out of. He is not a sugar daddy who just wants everyone to be happy. He wants us to be divinely happy. But like any good parent, as St. Paul says in the letter to the Hebrews, he disciplines the children that he loves. So God is infinitely transcendent beyond us. And in that infinity of he who is, that is an existence that is inaccessible to us. Grace is what makes it accessible. 
because he says, I love enter into friendship. But left on the level of nature, it's why when you see in all paganism, paganism has a whole surrounding about fear. God is the thunder, God is the lightning, God is the ocean that drowns your sons in the ships, Poseidon. So you have to placate them by giving gifts to make them happy. All you have to do is read the myths to see how fickle these individuals are portrayed as. But it all has this idea of working with fickle individuals and power. And our Lord says, with you, it is not so. The gospel brings a totally different vision. Notice the gospel today. It says, do not be anxious about what you will say when they drag you before the courts. It will be given to you what to say. Because it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your Father who speaks within you. And that brings us to the other aspect of God. When we look at God in the metaphysical level of just that existence as we have, we also know that God is a person. Triune, Father, Son, and Word, and Father, Word, and Spirit, excuse me. But that personality means there is something that we call intellect and will. In us, they're distinct. To know and to love, these are distinct things within us. In God, they're identical with that metaphysical he who is. Do we understand that? No. We just know that the reality is that God thinking, God thought, and God thinker are all exactly identically the same and infinite in reality. But in that reality, what is known and what is loved with an infinite goodness is God himself identical, and the will and the, the, the will and the intellect of God being perfect in a complete simplicity and purity adhering to the infinite good. Now, why am I throwing this philosophy out to you, or theology? It's because in our striving as human beings, we have intellect and will. We are free beings. We know, we love, we choose. The ultimate thing that we are created for is infinite goodness. But when we bumble around in our world, it's a bunch of little good, good things. Brownies, cupcakes, sex, weed, alcohol, whatever it is, they all have a goodness to them. We can abuse them, which is why I threw in sex, weed, and alcohol. Because we can abuse them, but what we're choosing still is something that we perceive as being good. It's just in those cases we're wrong. Because we're giving them a value that they don't have. That weed is not going to satisfy my life. Though in the beginning, you get a pretty good punch and that's it. Hey, that was a nice evening. Let's do it again. And do it again. And after a while, you realize it doesn't do anything. So you have to do something else. Because our will and our intellects are always free in this valley of tears because we're not confronted with the infinite goodness. The saints in heaven and the angels, they cannot not look upon God because that infinite goodness is exactly what they were created for. And so they find the full satisfaction and satiation of their very human existence in the vision of the divinity. They cannot not look at God. The same way that the demons, by their choice of sin, they are always in rage against that same infinite goodness. They can't get away from it. The damned cannot escape infinite goodness. It underlies, as I say, the reality of all existence. And the damned know it better than you do because they live the experience of that separation. We, we waffle around. We can live in sin and be separated, but we always have the chance to repent until we die. But with bad habits, that repentance becomes harder and harder and harder and harder, which is why it says, I've never received anyone into the church at the age of 82. 70 year olds kind of still on the edge, but when grace is really hunting you down, is in those middle years, when you're no longer the stupid kid and an adolescent, but now the seriousness of life starts to settle in, that's when grace will really begin to haunt. People don't have midlife crises, 
They have crises of conscience at the age of 40. What is the meaning of my life? What if it's been its value? So these are the forms of death. But because that infinite goodness is self-same identical, will, intellect, infinite goodness, that's the divinity. We talk about it as being perpetually the habitual virtue, power. The human being that's created in that image of will and of intellect has to find this reality and that's what makes God accessible to us by grace. So why are we doing this? Why is it so complicated? Life in itself is not complicated. But in every moral choice we make, there is a complexity that I've just described to you. Everything. Whether it's the third piece of cake, whether it is an ennobled usage of your speech in leading others to the faith, the same complexity is behind everything we choose because it always involves our intellect and our will. You are not machines. You are not just simply victims of the circumstances of your life. Circumstances have effects on it, of course. Where you live, where you're born, who your parents are, how they've educated you, how they've not educated you. These all have effects on you, but you still remain radically a free individual unless you are completely mentally incompetent, which doesn't happen very often percentage-wise in the human race. And that reality will always be the confrontation of death and life, always. It may seem small, whether it's a second piece of cake, but it's still ultimately, ultimately a question of life and death. So the second piece of cake, does it matter in itself? Not a lot. But if tomorrow I eat this another second piece of cake, and the third day a second piece of cake, and the fourth day, I now begin to build dispositions which embrace habitually, the same way we talk about the divinity as being habitually this eternal moral goodness. So for us, we become morally fixed in our habits. This is why those people that you know who are of a certain age, and I like this part of my age because I always say old people, we, you know? I, when I was 27 in preaching, it was like, who is the kid? Who is the altar boy in the pulpit? I used, to get, I used to get that, my son, my grandson is younger, is older than you. And for physicians and for priests, youth is the handicap of the profession. Who wants surgery done by a 32-year-old on your body? Uh-uh. No. Give me the 60-year-old guy. That one I'll trust. But it's because as we go through our lives and we look at these different things, this is why death has its three different values. One is just a physical death, which is what our Lord is talking about in the gospel today. But there is this moral death and this moral life, which is the moral life is a death to sin. So when St. Paul is saying what we are doing by being baptized into our Lord's death, we rise with him to that life of grace because the more that we adhere to that infinite, habitually good God, the more that death and those bad habits die within us. It doesn't mean that I come to the point that I hate the second piece of cake. What I come to is to love a better, what do we call it? dietary hygiene or something, whatever you want to call it, I come to appreciate the health in life better. It was amusing. Because I was reading in, you have the new bishop in Portland now, Bishop Ruggieri. And it's one of the things that I regret leaving now, because I think he's going to be terrific. But in one of the interviews he was being done, he said, of course, Ruggieri, they're Italians. So all the women, being women and being wonderfully generous, they all start making Italian food for him. But he had to tell them that he follows a vegan diet, which pretty well kills anything from the Italian peninsula. So it was humorous in itself, an expectation, and I don't know why he's chosen that diet, but I would presume it has to do with asceticism and also with health, I suppose. I don't know. You'll have to ask him after I'm gone. But it's those kinds of details. It isn't that you come to hate the second piece of cake. You come to love what is good. 
because it is good. When we love the second piece of cake, it's just because, I don't know, it tastes good, so I just eat it. That's the way the two-year-old acts. But as we come to the death of sin, of that selfishness that we call sin, that death to sin only takes place because grace has grown within our lives. All right. So you bring all that together. Now you read the gospel again. When our Lord says, they will be antagonistic to you. Because the more that you are a vehicle of grace, so that you become the face of Christ to the people who are around you, not because you're choosing to vaunt it, but just because the gospel has penetrated your life so profoundly that the Lord Jesus is just what you love. And with that guilelessness, right? Be as shrewd as serpents and as guileless as doves. That reality just will radiate out. And the world, the world who likes the death of sin, will always rage against you. That's why our Lord says, the disciple is not greater than his teacher. It's enough if you become like his teacher. And our Lord says at the Last Supper, if they've hated me, huh, sorry my friends, they're going to hate you for exactly the same reason that they hate Christ. Now, we're not talking about mediocre Catholics here, right? Mediocre Catholics are not on the, on the liturgical calendar. Those people never became martyrs because they weren't the face of Christ in the world. So the world didn't really care. The world didn't even notice them because they lived like the world. The world doesn't care. The world loves what the world loves, the second piece of cake, the weed, the sex, and the alcohol and opioids. So when you live that level, they don't care. They don't even see you. You're incognito. You're hidden. You're invisible to them. But if you live that life of the gospel, you don't even have to say anything. It is evident. The way you live, the way you speak, the things you do for your recreation, this will all radiate that life of Christ. And the world will hate it the same way the world killed Christ. This is why our Lord is saying, this is the logic. Come to the light, embrace the gospel, follow me. And the world will hate you like it hates me. That's why he finishes his gospel today by saying, if they've called the master of the household Beelzebub, call him a demonic name, what will they do to the rest of the members of the house? Why should you be surprised? And the reason why we went through this long and intricate sermon is because of that quotation we began with. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried. If you've loved God and responded to grace, God loves you infinitely more in response. So don't worry. Don't be anxious about what you're going to say. I'm in prison. There's a woman that I knew. She was an Austrian. Madame Tengere. So she has an Italian name because she married an Italian man. Terrible oath. But she, when she got married, I don't know, in the 1950s or whatever it was, she had made a vow on her wedding day that her life in matrimony, on the wedding day itself, when everything is great, right? She made a vow to God that her married life would be able to be for the glorification of the sacrament of marriage. And then as the years went on, it came to the realization that her husband was a loser and a womanizer. And he separated from her. She lived in Naples, in a beautiful house that overlooked, apartment that overlooked the Bay of Naples. She never left Naples, even though she was Austrian, and she always remained in the city and apparently haunted this man for the rest of his life because she wouldn't leave the city to go back to see her family without calling him and asking permission, because after all, I'm married to you. You have someone else in your apartment, but I am married to you. Now, she wouldn't say that. She would just call and make sure that it was okay with her husband that she took two weeks off to go to Austria. This woman was also a spiritual daughter of Padre Pio, which may explain part of this. And do you know what Padre Pio gave her? Because this is the way Jesus loves. What he gave her for her apostolate? You will smuggle liturgical items behind the Iron Curtain. 
And so she began decades long apostolate of gathering up mass kits, linens, chalices, vestments, and making frequent trips into the Eastern Bloc. And on one of these days, she was arrested in Czechoslovakia when Czechoslovakia still existed. And she was thrown in the prison by the communist guards. She had no idea what they were going to do to her. People disappear all the time, especially in those days. You get past Checkpoint Charlie, you don't know what's going to happen. But she made a vow to the mother of God that if she was released or she got out of here alive, that she would make a pilgrimage every, every year to Maria Zell. It's a famous Marian shrine in Austria. And after being thrown into this prison cell, and then after having made this vow, having no idea what was going on, they came in in midnight into the cell, dragged her out, took her to the border, shoved her back over into whatever, Germany or whatever, Austria, wherever it's bordering. And she kept that vow and always walking the last mile barefoot to the shrine of Our Lady. This is an extraordinary woman. But when I give you those details, there is nothing in her life that was easy. And yet this was a trend. You didn't have to talk to Madame Tangeri much. She just radiated the peace of Christ. That's why I'm giving you this story. When our Lord says, don't be anxious when you're in the prison. Because it's not you who speak. Because of this union with God, it's not you who speak, but your Father, the Spirit of your Father who speaks within you. So what our Lord is saying, don't expect miracles unless you look for miracles now, which is grace, and to respond to grace, and to be faithful to your prayers, and to have your conversations be virtuous and noble as our, our actions should be virtuous and noble to pursue goodness. When we do that, our Lord says, don't worry about the rest. So they beat you and you die. You'll be with me faster. It's not meant to be flippant. But it's to say, if your life is already in union with Christ, you have died to sin. And if the sinful world arrests you and beats you, too bad for the world. You are free. This is a stunning gospel. This is why you've had millions upon millions, hundreds of millions of people sign on the dotted line. Because when you understand what is being taught, it is beautiful beyond anything in this world. When our Lord in the same Last Supper, when he says to them, they will treat you. If they've hated me, they will hate you. If they receive my word, they'll receive your word. It's the same place where our Lord winds up talking about, do not be anxious. I have overcome the world. These are beautiful considerations because remember, we're in the fast of the apostles now. And the apostolic life, which is not just for priests, but it's for all of the baptized, to a different degree, obviously, in a different little sphere of influence, but just as real. So read this chapter 10, because this chapter 10 of St. Matthew is the whole calling of the apostles. Meditate on it this week during the fast. Prepare for the feast of the apostles. Die to sin. Embrace life and then await death, not only with hope, but even with a certain anticipation, because you've already embraced infinite goodness well before you die. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only one God, Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, right from right, true God from true God, begotten in our name, consubstantial to the Father, through healing all things in me, to us men for our salvation, he and I are the And by the Holy Spirit, as incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and the King of for our own sake, he was crucified in the conscious fire. He suffered death and was buried. He rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. 
He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in and glory to the judge of the living and the dead, and of his kingdom of God and the land. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of God, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in the one holy God and the Son of we confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Eternal to my dem hain da lo ho, wala da lo ho, dem hare ta yut. Aignem su go taim o ta, ke yu lal vai ta fais go dem hayek lo, ont go da shofem. upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and His plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, our Holy Father, St. Mary, St. Jude, and St. Agrippina. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
continue with the anaphora of St. Sixtus, Pope of Rome, on page 856. 856. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Holy Father, grant security, peace, and everlasting love to your church, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor, love and faith that are pleasing to God. us and make us worthy of the eternal reward reserved for men and women of peace and we raise glory to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we offer you these holy mysteries that through them you may free us from the sufferings caused by sin and enable us to work for justice, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son, on the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Amen. With heart, mind, and tongue, we give you thanks, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one true God. Join spiritually to the invisible choirs and countless ranks of angels. Your faithful people glorify you with them, and three times they proclaim. Holy is your God, the Father. Holy is your only Son. Holy is your Spirit. For the incarnation of your Son, you saved the world, freed it from sin, kept it from falling and strong. Oh, no, Danny, 
de mon dilan dianti qui chadato, d'achlo faikun, wachlo sagiem, metin shadu, metin yad, ou soyon, hame wa hoye dan kailam alamin. And he added these words, whenever you share in these holy mysteries, remember my death, burial, and resurrection until I come again. Forget the amazing events of your plan of salvation and the fearful signs of your second coming when you shall reward all people according to their deeds. Now your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. May these holy mysteries the Lord allow us to share in them to find joy in your presence. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Invincible fortress against false teachings for your church and her shepherds. Assist our fathers, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bishara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, with blameless lives and with purity and holiness. May they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. O Lord, reward those who do good, free those bound by hardships, liberate the poor, and visit those who are dejected, distressed, and weary. We pray to you, O Lord. O Lord, be a fortification for every city and country that truly believes in you and takes refuge in you. We pray to you, O Lord. O Lord, strengthen those who call upon the mother of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the saints who have pleased you, especially Saint Joseph, Saint Marin, and Saint Jude. Through your grace, make us and our departed worthy of the eternal blessings that you have prepared for your saints. We pray to you, O Lord. O Lord, 
forgive the faithful departed who have been redeemed by the death of your only Son. And on that day when all are rescued from death, delivered from the realm of the dead, and raised from the dust of the grave, the grace of your only Son will have been glorified in us and in them. Through him we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. O Lord, in the resurrection on the last day, when all is renewed, make all son our departed worthy, through your grace, of the joy of your heavenly kingdom. In all sin, in all things, may your blessed and most honored name be glorified, praised, and exalted. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. sanctify our bodies and souls and purify our minds and consciences so that we may call upon you, O Father of mercies, and implore you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of those. O Lord, hasten to transform all that is harmful and detrimental into that which will help and benefit us, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. Shlomo Elokulukunam, Ma'am Ruho O Lord, may your graces, your blessings, and all your divine gifts descend in abundance upon your church, your parishes, monasteries, and convents, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy God, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, that's the name of the Lord, for He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be the glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies be sanctified by your and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us. Holy Father, our mouths accustomed to earthly food give you thanks for your grace that has made us worthy of this heavenly food, the body and blood of your only Son. Through him and with him 
Glory, power, and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo Elkhudna, Ba'amru Hudilah. O Christ, you are the heavenly bread who came down and became for us the food that does not perish. At your second coming, may we not become the food of the imperishable fire. And we raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. <laughs> 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 